Hello, all you amazing humans, and thanks again for listening to the show. Today, I have Alexis Armstrong, and she may not be directly related to skilled trade, but she definitely has some tool knowledge background, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to share with you uh, all about her, a little bit about her background. Um, she's geology-based. She's got three degrees. She spent some time living at sea while working with International Ocean Discovery Program. And we're going to talk more about that in the show. And she's also created the Smoko podcast, as well as Peggy Workwear. So all of these things are related to the show and how we're doing things in women in trades here. And um, I'm excited to talk to you, Alexis. So thanks for joining me. And um, I look forward to hearing more about what you're up to. So Let's just get, let's just jump in. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, it's such an honor to be here and um, thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's <laughs> my honor too to have you on. So tell me, tell me all about it. What was, what was the driving force for you to go down the university path and choosing geology? And then tell me a little bit more about the degrees that you've obtained and then we'll get into how the piggy work work thing came into it. Totally. 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 Um, so Honestly, at first, I wasn't actually going to go to university. Um, I was actually going to go to art school. And I got a scholarship in grade 11. And they said, ditch high school and come straight to being an artist and um, come do this program. And it was at the same time that I was falling in love with arts and, and science, specifically biology at the same time. Um, and my dad basically was like, if you drop out of high school, you're dead, man. You're not allowed to do that. Don't go in straight into art school. Um, and so that was kind of my path. I, I had kind of two. It was either art school or it was going to be university because I was really falling in love with two subjects of pure biology and then pure art, fine art um, and drawing and design. So that was kind of why I chose science was because of parental being like, don't you dare drop out of high school <laughs> because like that was the only other option at that mind in my like little 17 formed brain of being like, oh, I'm not going to wait until 18. I'm either going to do like all or nothing or, or leave high school. So that was kind of that pathway of going into university and choosing to do sciences. I also figured that'd be easier to pick up art later um, while having a science career and then doing art on the side, other than opposite of being an artist first and a scientist second, that seemed a little bit more difficult. And so I entered into university and I did a pure biology degree originally. And in my second year, I took this bird course in geology and this beautiful, wonderful woman came in. She was like seven feet tall in my mind. And she had two pigtails down to her like mid kind of waist and she was just this like huge commanding powerful figure and her name was Dr. Sandra Barr and she was a geologist and this little bird course all of a sudden took over my life and I like remember seeing her and then being like okay I'm gonna become a geologist like that's that's that simple um so Dr. Sandra Barr she converted me like right away within a second year course I did a combination of biology geology um in geology, I knew that I wanted to work in academia, specifically working on a research vessel or a deep sea drilling vessel called the Droides Resolution. And that required a master's degree. So I went and um, got my master's so that I could go on the ship and I could work on this drilling vessel. Um, and then when I kind of was at the drilling vessel, I realized, okay, well, this is going to be the origin story of Peggy Workwear. That's where that came in. Um, but at that point, I was like, man, I have no business degree, no business school whatsoever, or no business um, background. So I went back to school and did an MBA just to understand a little bit more of business. My kind of thoughts with education is I've been lucky enough to go come in on scholarship. And so for me, it hasn't been um, a huge financial burden. And I think because of that, I've always viewed school as an opportunity to learn. And if I'm having a gap within my skill set or within my knowledge, I go back to school to learn it. Um, that's a big privilege to have that, that opportunity to come in on scholarship. I know not everybody's as lucky and that that pathway of getting multi multiple degrees is highly costly if you're paying everything out of pocket. I was very fortunate in that, that regard. But um, those are the degrees and those are hopefully kind of the the twists and turns. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I get the whole um, sort of parental push 
um, you know, mine were fairly university centric as well. I didn't end up going to university at all. I ended up just going into trades, but or not just by went into trades. And um, I also kind of get the fact that, you know, that you start off as one thing and then you have somebody that influences you in a certain way and it changes the course of your life. Like there's these little, these, these markers in your life. And it's just like, okay, you're looking back. You're like, oh, that was so significant. That changed my life. Like that minute, that day, that person, whatever it was, <laughs> yeah. it changed the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the beauty of going to university is that you're exposed to so many things and so many people and many things that we don't even know about or talk about at large um, in the community that, you know, you end up falling into mm. and becoming, you know, really enamored by. So I think that's a really beautiful way to describe how, you know, your pathway sort of changed from biology to geology. And I love the fact that, you know, you're, you, you, speak to this sort of idea of lifelong learning that's a big tenant for me mm -hmm. i'm constantly learning about something it doesn't matter if it's you know at bcit or i'm doing something self-directed i'm constantly constantly learning and i have so many different interests yeah uh, like right now i'm really into drums so i'm trying to learn how to teach myself drums but um you know just always there's always something for me that's grabbing me and, and wanting uh, attention my attention to learn and to like sort of um, sate that whole desire to to have some novelty in my life you know I think that's part of what it is for me mm -hmm. so I, I like the whole idea of lifelong learning and we've talked about that concept a number of times with other uh, guests I've had on the show in the wit series here where you know we're talking about how just because you start in, in one um, role in whatever company you're in or whatever trade you're in doesn't mean that you have to stay there forever and there's a lot of room for movement so you know you've just sort of exemplified that uh, just by your pathway to get to where you are. So now tell me a little bit more about this origin story of, of Peggy Workwear being on the um, the vessel that you were working on and what what was the the, the impetus behind, uh, you know, the, the creation of what that is? Um, well, first yeah. of all, tell everybody what it is. I mean, I'm sure we can <laughs> guess, but just like maybe give, give us a little overview about what Peggy Workwear is. Of course. <laughs> First off, I do say I love the the conversation of lifelong learning, and I love that that also resonated with you because I feel the same way, and I love that you're learning the drums. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> um, for Peggy Workwear, we are a women's workwear company. We're brand new. We're about to launch. Um, we're workwear that's designed by women for women. What we do is we create clothing that fits and functions for your everyday because what I found is I've worked in this industry. I worked in industrial settings since I was 19. My first career when I was in undergrad in the summers, I would get shit up, shipped up north and I would work in mining. And I was in mining camps for a long period of time and working in exploration. So that's like in the middle of the woods, walking around or working in a core shack or it's working underground. So that was one chunk of my life. And then I really wanted to do this vessel work and work on IODP, which is a deep sea drilling vessel that drills down into the bottom of the seafloor and grabs ocean cores. It's gone for two months at a time. It's complete 24 seven drilling operations. It's pretty high core industrial. Worked on that afterwards. So those are my two kind of pathways professionally and industrial wise. Those were my two environments. Long origin, sorry, but basically what throughout that entire experience, I could never find clothes. And I think that's a really, really common thing. I don't think I'm unique in that. I think that's just like a known. I think every single person that's listening is like, ah, yeah, duh. Like they don't exist. There's like nothing out there that's made for us. And then the stuff that's made for us, I found it was always really ill-fitting to me. And I think with workwear, if it doesn't fit properly, it's not going to function. And it's also not going to keep you safe and allow you to do your tasks correctly or at a high level. I know that I've been in improper PPE and an improper workwear, and it's been a straight up safety hazard. I've had people be like, yeah, if you go into the lake like that, you're going to drown. Your safety suit is going to pull you down to the very bottom of the lake. Like I've had things work opposite. So that was my entire experience professionally. At the same time that that was happening to me, my younger sister, who is part of the company and who is a huge inspiration to me, she's a red sail welder. Um, she was the woman who was like, now, nah, you know, university, not for me. I'm going to go straight into trades. I was like, I'm going to go to art school. She was like, I'm going to go to trades. But the entire time that she was a welder, she also 
could never find clothes. It was the exact same um, situation and lived experience. And so what happened is while I was working one day um, on the Jordy's resolution, I bent over to pick up a tool and I heard a terrible, terrible sound, which I'm sure many women have heard before. And my overalls had completely ripped from like crotch all the way up. And I was standing in the middle of a lab at my work in the middle of the ocean with my butt out. And I, it was one of my only pairs of pants because we don't go into to shore for two months at a time. And I was like, this, this is it. This is ridiculous. And I'm going to start a company. And I called up Andrea, my sister, and I was like, I'm going to do this. And she was like, yep, let's go. And that was Peggy Workwear. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, again, I, I, there's a, a lot of common themes that I end up mm. talking about with um, my guests on the WIT series. And, um, you know, proper fitting PPE is definitely one of the things that has been a theme throughout. And it's also been something that many studies that, you know, government funded things have um, done and around like, why are we having a hard time attracting and retaining women in trade and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has come up is that, you know, there's not a, a specific um, proper fitting PPE mm -hmm. uh, sort of brand or clothing or even work boots. I mean, like there's more, more footwear now that is specifically made for women, you know, women's sizes, as opposed to us trying to fit into a men's very small boot. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was first starting out, that's what I was doing. I was basically getting the smallest men's boot I could find and, and fitting my foot into that. And, and I have small feet, I'm a size six women. So it's like, I'm very small men's <laughs> sizes. Um, and yeah, just typically things that, you know, are made and uh, you know, fitted around a man's body is not typically going to fit around a, women who are typically much smaller. I mean, some of us are, you know, equivalent to a, a man's size, but also there's plenty of young men or men in general who are very slim. Mm -hmm. And even those men are having problems finding work where that fits them properly. So the proper fitting PPE is definitely a universal thing, but it really is something that is a barrier or has been a barrier for women Mm -hmm. to feel comfortable and safe on work sites. So I think what you're doing is, is going to help to fill that, that gap of where things are falling down the wayside for women in the PPE world. So I, um, you know, I just want to give you the sort of the hats off to, to taking that on. <laughs> um, now, I mean, obviously, you know, you sort of came through university route and all that kind of stuff. And you just mentioned, oh yeah, you went, went, went down to pick up a tool. So we, we women that come on the show they're from the skilled trades and they are, have like a lot of tool knowledge and understanding um now tell me about some tools that you would use as a geologist or some of those the, the tools that you've used in your work over the years um i mean they're all they're all tools they're all things that we need to know how to use and and manipulate to get us to whatever our end result is going to be so maybe tell me a little bit about some of the tools that you would be using as a geologist yeah, totally. Um, so our tools are a little bit different. We're definitely not as hardcore. I mean, like my sister will pick up like sledgehammers that are like bigger than my face and she's, she's a shipbuilder. So like her, like sledge is like literally the scariest thing I've ever seen. And I'm like, thank goodness that that's not my day that I'm not like, I'm not swinging that every day. So she's way more hardcore. You guys are way more hardcore than us. Um, but we do use a lot of tools. We just use them a little bit differently. So we have a lot of saws and grinders, and we have a lot of things that are made specifically for rocks. So a rock tumbler, a rock grinder, a rock saw. Um, we usually have to cut cores um, a couple different ways. So a couple different saws um, there. We'll have a lot of like drill presses, anything to get samples from rock. That's kind of our main bread and butter of some of our power tools on on the ship what was different about it is this program has been a U.S. government program it has been kind of the leader in climate change since the 1960s and it's a complete one-off like this ship is the only ship that does what it does that goes as deep as it does it's a very unique ship and it does very unique science and because of that all of the tools and equipment were one of one and what that meant is that we actually created a lot of them so we'd be using yeah we'd be using a bunch of like normal tools like your wrenches and everything but we'd be creating customized benches we do a lot of carpentry we would just 
basic carpentry. I would never say that I'm very good at it, but we would do, do the basics to create our wood top. And then we would do the basics of um, some metal work of just getting structure. And then a lot of like fine tuning of putting on our instruments. Um, we would do basic electrical, but again, I will not say that I am an expert at, at that. I'm a very good helper, but I would never <laughs> be like, I will, I will take charge of this like $20,000 equipment and be like, I'm going to be the one wiring it. Absolutely not. I'm going to help my friend who is an electrician do it. I hand you that. I hand you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I'm going to be there to learn, but I'm not going to be like the one leading the charge. So my background in some tools has been either as somebody who's helping or watching, but a lot of them has been fine tuning with our equipment and creating custom equipment. Um, the yeah, true... I mean, the necessity being the mother of invention, right? So, you know, like <laughs> yes. if you're trying to, trying to get a tool to do something that's not quite what it was designed for, it becomes a safety issue, um, mm -hmm. but it's also not uh, allowing you to perform the job or the duties in an effective and efficient way. So sometimes, yeah, I mean, like if this tool is, is close to what we need, well, what can we do to change it to make our, our need for it that much better? So yeah, yeah. I mean, necessity being mother mentioned, you're like, you don't have to reinvent Completely. the wheel, you can tweak whatever you've got and make it a little bit better and function for you, right? Yeah, that's exactly like that entire lab stack has been like 40 years of tweaking and invention. And like we have a CAD machine, we have like 3D printers, we have everything has been kind of custom created for our output because our output and our entire operation is just so unique. Um, and then we did have a couple like really fun demo days or like when we'd have to like lock up the lab that then I get to have like a little bit of a sledgehammer party time, but it's not the same as my sister's. It's not the same as the shipbuilding, like as hardcore as the scale trades. And I have nothing but like awe and appreciation to like women that are so comfortable on the tools. Cause I'm comfortable on rock tools, but not as comfortable. Um, happy to take a little bit of a backseat and learn. Yeah. I mean, like, well, uh, as many people if they've listened to more than one show, you know, I'm a joiner, I'm a maker. So I, I'm comfortable with all of those tools, but I'm not a welder. So I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with a TIG welder and a helmet and the whole thing. Like, I don't really know anything about welding. I know, yes, I know a small amount, but yeah. I, I would never say um, that I could go into anywhere and weld anything. Like, absolutely yeah. not. So yeah, I mean, like you learn as you go and, and sometimes, you know, you get really proficient as you move along, right? So mm -hmm. I, I get that, you know. I will say though, like one funny story is um, within mining, even though it's really, really remote up in Northern Canada, like everything can get to you within a couple of days. So if something breaks, you're like, oh, okay, we're going to do our best, but we're not screwed if we don't finish it. On the boat, you're totally you're in the middle of your nowhere. Own. You're like, in the really? middle of nowhere. Like you're completely like we'd be like three thousand meters of water depth. Like we would be in the middle of the Indian Ocean, haven't seen land for like three weeks. Like we would be in literally the middle of nowhere. And so what I wasn't used to when I first got that job is that when something broke, it was my responsibility. I was kind of used to being a little bit more cerebral, and again, just like using um, using rock tools, but I was then kind of just being like, okay, like I'm a knowledge-based expert. Like I'll tell you about that rock. And then my boss was like, absolutely not. We know about that rock. We all are knowledge-based experts. I need you to fix your machine. And I was like, I'm not an engineer. And she was like, well, become one. Like, I was like, I don't know how to run electrical. She was like, well, you're about to learn. Like this is, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a crazy learning experience. And like, a dive off the deep end of um of getting comfortable with tools and getting comfortable of being like okay if something breaks it's your responsibility of fixing it all right scary and cool <laughs> well, yeah i mean but then now you know right like you figured it out like yeah but typically i mean if we we all take the easy way if we can um for the most part yeah. but you know sometimes it's like no okay i gotta figure this out and you're so much better for it right I was a punk <laughs> kid. <laughs> so it was a funny thing. <laughs> I thought I was a punk kid. So it was a funny, <laughs> a funny of course. Thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you also have a podcast called the Smoko podcast. Um, and there's some 
intention and messaging and everything behind what you're doing with that podcast. So tell me a little bit more about that, because obviously we're on a podcast and I'm interested to know what, what you're doing with your platform. So the Smoko, thank you for that question. Um, the Smoko podcast, it it kind of originated from this idea of storytelling and like what stories are being told and what I found within working within mining and kind of working within male dominated spaces for a long time. I found that when people would ask me questions about it, um, they meant it in a kind way. They weren't trying to be like malicious or weird about it, but they would sometimes phrase the question of being like how difficult it is. Like how many times have you been harassed? What is this? Like they were really, really invasive, intrusive questions. And I felt like some of the storytelling was really focused on how hard it is and maybe how difficult it is for all women, but it wasn't really from the women themselves. It wasn't actually coming from the community members. And I felt like it was um, not a full story. It wasn't really looking at us as people. It was looking at us kind of as numbers or like a token within a space. And while I think that those conversations are so important, I think that they should only come from people if they want to talk about problems of culture, if they want to talk about the hard things that happen in industrial environments. Um, and it shouldn't be something that's that's forced. And I think that we should also really focus on women's storytelling of who they are of like how you became a joiner and like, what's your favorite thing about being a joiner and really about who you are other than focusing on maybe the fact that you're a woman in a space that might not have been designed for you. Again, we can have that conversation if you want to have that conversation, but I think I'd be far more interested in being like, well, how was your journey? How did you discover the trades? How did you know that that was going to be your path? Like those are the questions that I'm interested in. And I think that that's what we were missing um, in terms of storytelling and increasing representation of women in these spaces. Um, so that's where that idea and that concept of Smoko came from, because while workwear I think is so important and it's a big thing that is holding women back from staying within professions or entering professions, I think what's more important is changing culture and increasing representation. I think that's really our mission as a company is just to get more women and gender diverse people in these careers because I think they're fantastic. And I think the women that I've met within them have been some of the coolest people that I have ever, ever met. Um, and so that was really just to highlight and and showcase the women of who they are and let them tell their story however they would like to tell it. And the idea behind the name is smoke goes or breaks on the ship. And right. that that was one of the only time um, that I could have time to go sit with a couple girlfriends who also worked on the ship and we could just shoot the shit and talk about anything. And um, yeah, it was kind of this beautiful moment. So I was like, okay, well, why not Let's bring that to the rest of the community and let's have a smoko with a bunch of women and people within the community in different occupations. And let's talk about everything and anything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I love that, um, uh, you know, you're, you wanted to learn about the stories of how they got to where they are and all that kind of stuff. Cause that's also important to me when I'm talking to, you know, women in this series about like, like, how did you get here? What, what was mm -hmm the drive for you to get to this place and where do we want to go from here and yeah we have a, a, an experience that tells us that you know there are things that occur in the workplace that maybe are not ideal and how are we going to change it how, how are we going to advocate and how are we going to support each other and all that but more importantly it's like we're all we're all human and we're all in this this thing together you know we're walking in the world as a community mm -hmm. um, none of us is not walking on the planet you know what I mean so <laughs> Um, I love that you're bringing that into to the sort of the show that you're producing and, and uh, putting out into the world. I think that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So uh, on that note, I mean, so how did you, I guess, how do I want to frame this question? Basically, um, I'm gathering that you probably had some experiences that were not ideal and mm. navigate through them and whatever. And we're not going to like belabor all of that because we all kind of have an idea of what that might be. Mm. Um, but, you know, as you're navigating forward, are you feeling and seeing um, the narrative change all or is it, or sort of the, I'm always interested to know, are we moving the needle? 
mm. in what we're doing in our efforts. Are we, are we, are we helping? What can we do more of? And I think having conversations like this are really important. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just, I'm always curious to know how we're feeling about where the needle is going. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you've seen or heard any sort of empirical evidence that tells us that the needle is moving in the right direction. I, oh, this is a, this is an amazing question. This is a really beautiful question. Um, it's something that I think about often because I want to say yes. Like I want to be like, yes, we are moving the needle in the right direction. And it feels right now, like right now there's a huge movement and there's a huge push in community that are all trying to do the same thing. And there's people all across North America, all across New Zealand, Australia, Europe that are kind of having the same mission and the same values and kind of idea of what the future of women in trades or women in STEM could look like. So I want to say gut reaction, yes, because I want to be optimistic and like feel the energy that you're meeting people and everyone's agreeing with like, this is, yes, this is the direction that we have to go. But then I do think if you look at the data on the empirical data, I don't think we have moved the needle. And I think women in trades have stayed stagnant at 5% for 25 years. And yep. I think women of STEM throughout all STEM, like obviously different sectors have more women. I think we're roughly 15. If you look at like all pure sciences. Um, so we still have a huge way to go. Um, and I think we still have these really long rooted problems of culture within industries and of, um, implicit bias. I think we still have structural problems in our jobs about being moms and also working. I know in geology, a huge conversation is field work. Um, yeah because I can't have a family if I'm at sea for six months of the year. Like that's very, very difficult to have both of those things. So I think sometimes the structures of our, of our industries aren't really well designed to move the needle. And I think that's where we really need to focus on is implicit bias and big bias within our organizations and culture problems of harassment and bigotry and sexual harassment harassment and assault. Um, we need to make sure people are safe at work. And I think that we still have a long way to go. Um, but I hope that, <laughs> I hope that kind of the conversations that I'm having within my little circle, and I know that's a tiny little niche thing, but I'm hoping that that type of conversation is happening all across North America and all across kind of the world that we're getting that movement of more women that are talking about things that are changing culture and creating organizations to make better changes. Um, I want to say yes, but I think the data right now is, is still a little stagnant. Um, I know I've been blabbing, so I'll, I'll stop soon. But the one thing that I, I have given me a lot of hope is I have interviewed a couple of women who have been absolutely fantastic and who have been on the research side. So um, one's an engineer and she's doing inclusivity research and one is a dean at SAIT and she did a bunch of inclusivity work as well and that's wonderful to see professors and researchers at both vocational and universities doing the actual um, scientific method and putting it into peer review and getting funding to do these type of research programs and I think that is also a fantastic positive change because I think that's when government can all of a sudden have data that they can be like, yeah, okay, we do have to change policy here or we do have to put this initiative in. I think that's where big change happens is through research. I think that's one big kind of lever to move the needle. So that has been something that has given me a lot of hope. Yeah, I mean, I'm done. That's a big spiel. Oh, Sorry. No, it's, oh, fantastic. I mean, um, it's a whole, it's a whole other perspective that is not really that that nobody in my sphere, you know, is really in that world. So it's I it's fantastic for me to to learn and listen. Um, I think you're right though in that. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm personally not seeing a huge change in the needle. I am feeling a little more encouraged with some um, some of the conversations I've been having about how many women are considering being in the trades, like new, new young women. Um, I know, personally know two or three from my kids uh, mm -hmm. sort of generation that are going towards electrical or carpentry or whatever. And it's really gratifying to see them go that direction. Um, 
and to have their, and, and honestly, and to have their parents support it because my generation and older, like it was all university. If you don't go to university, you're not going to have a good life. And that narrative is slow, has slowly changed. I think it's no longer so much blue collar, white collar, you know, mm -hmm. dark, um, because more and more we're finding that because of the skilled trade, trade work, sh worker shortage, um, wages are going up like crazy all the time. And, you know, don't no matter how nicely you ask an AI tool or Alexa or Siri, they're not going to like change your toilet or like mm -hmm. fix your electrical or put a new panel in, or if a, mm -hmm. a telephone pole falls down or a tree falls on your house, you still need people to actually physically do the work. Mm -hmm. And those people and those skills are going to be so much more in demand as time goes on, because already the boomers have been retiring and already we don't have enough people to sort of fill those roles and more and more people are on the planet and more and more buildings being done. I don't, I don't are you in Vancouver area? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm like, I look at Granville Island and from my window, oh. right? <laughs> um, like there are so many towers being built. There's so many house rentals going on. It's, it's nuts. Mm. It's how much sheer building there's going on right now. And I'm actually amazed that there's that many projects going because there's not <laughs> enough people to do the work. Yeah. Anyway. So like just having that sort of a little bit of empirical data on my side, just seeing some young people sort of choose the trades is really encouraging. Um, but I also think too, something that you touched on was once money gets to push towards research, mm -hmm. then I think the change starts happening more because now we have a benchmark. Mm -hmm. Obviously somewhere along the line, someone's gone, oh yeah, this is important for us to know where are we at and how much of a, um, impact is this having right now? What could it potentially have depending on what the research project is, of course. But, um, you know, I think once we start putting a, a broader or sorry, a narrower lens on like the actual data, I think that's where the stuff starts changing because you can't dispute the data. How many people are, were in trade then now, how many people are entering, how many dollars are being spent? What's the median wage? What's, you know, like they're all, all these different sort of, you know, pieces that show us the full picture. Mm -hmm. And then if we don't know where we started, how do we know if we're gaining, if mm -hmm. we're getting anywhere? It's like a before and after shot, <laughs> like a renovation. How do we know if we, did it good if we never knew what it, what it was to start with? Like, oh yeah, that looks look like garbage before, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a, it's a good, a good note to kind of consider is that, yeah, like if there's some funding going towards research, mm -hmm. oftentimes from there, policy starts changing because the light has been shown shining on the lack of whatever right mm -hmm. so and i'm also you know my daughter is going to go into uh, general science next year oh, she's just graduating this year and um so she'll be a, one of the young women who are getting into the stem sort of programs and um yeah i'm excited to see where she goes with it and i mean who knows like she, she doesn't know what she, she doesn't know what she wants to do she's going to go and into science and, and, you know, she's got the, the grades to go there and, you know, some desire and some interest and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. as well. So hopefully she'll find her path forward and, and, you know, have a teacher or two that yeah. <laughs> sort of have that, you know, euphoric moment of like, oh, this is what I want to do. And mm -hmm. like, you know, create, create that path and have that marker in her life that goes, oh yeah, that's where things change for me. So mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I love that little bit of your story too. And I'm hoping my daughter will have the same um, I was so, about to say, I was like, all she needs is a teacher that comes in and she can be like, yep, that's what I want to be. That's all she needs. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, so out of all these different things that you've done and tried and you're developing, I mean, what did, what, what are you, what are you enjoying the most or what did you enjoy the most? Oh, this is a really good question. It's going to sound like such a freaking cop out that I'm going to say everything. Um, but <laughs> I think that had, that is the answer though. Like I think for me, I think everything has been difficult on this new journey of doing podcast and designing a workwear company. Um, and everything has been beautiful at the same time in equal measure. It just depends on the day and maybe depends on the hour. But I think um, it's just been this wonderful learning experience. And it's just been something that has felt so fulfilling and so correct. Um, and even if it's difficult, like I, I didn't know how to do a podcast. I was Googling it as I was like creating a podcast, Me either. Same, <laughs> yeah, like, like it was all just really like by the, like, 
I don't know, by the skin of my teeth, like it was really just like figuring it out as I, as I went, but what I love the most and what really like fills my cup is helping people and being able to connect with people. And so at the end of the day, if I help one person, if I make them a pair of pants that they freaking love and that they can be on the tools all day and they can feel like themselves and they're durable and they work with them and they feel comfy and they move with them. If I can do that just for one person, I've won. Like if I can connect with one person on a podcast and someone out there can listen to maybe my sister or listen to cattle ranch or listen to whoever I've had on the show and for them to be like, Oh, Hey, maybe I want to do that. Or like, I want to become an iron worker. I think that it's worth it. And what has been really beautiful from the, this kind of journey and this, this new thing is I named my company after my 99 year old grandmother, Peggy. Um, and, Oh, I love that story already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like that's been really beautiful. And she didn't know I was going to do it. Like Peggy Workwear came to me as an idea like years ago now. And it's been this kind of secret thing that me and Andrea have been talking about me and my sister. Um, but she didn't know my, my grandma didn't know that it was named after her. And so that's been really beautiful. She's been a model. She did a whole series where she was like on the tools, pretending to like grind, doing with like a flamethrower. She had like a big, yeah, like it was so so much fun. Like it was my mom, my sister, my grandma, my grandma was flirting with a photographer. Like it was just this like really fun over the top day. And we've had multiple days like that of her getting to see women in the clothes that have her name on it, like getting to see people talk online to be like, Oh my goodness, Peggy's so cool. She'll read all of them or I'll read them to her. Cause she's very blind. And she'll just be like, Oh my goodness. Like that yeah. part has been unreal. So I, oh. from that kind of perspective, it's already been worth it. Oh, a hundred percent. I love it. I love it. All right. So, um, I always like to kind of close out the show with a, a couple of fun things sometimes. Been okay. Um, so typically I ask for like, what's your favorite tool and why? Mm-hmm. So in your experience being on tools, using the tools that you did and have been using, what were some of the, or what was the favorite one that you'd like, was like your go-to that you really enjoyed using or that was like indispensable to the work that you were doing? It was totally non-indispensable. It was like a bonus tool that I didn't have to use that often, but it was the rock grinder. Like it was making like beautiful thin sections and like beautiful small pieces of rock. It wasn't my everyday. Um, It wasn't a tool that's common, but, or even that complicated. All it is really is like more artistic, but it's just a slow grind and it's a slow part of getting a thin section perfect that you can epoxy it and getting like a slab of rock to the right thickness that you can then do a bunch of other studies onto it. But there was something so like, um, Oh, like meditated almost that like, you just kind of like go into a trance and you're just like doing something at such fine detail that I loved a a grinder day. Like I would do all my samples and I'd just be like, okay, well let's go like 10 hours of just listening to music and slowly grinding rocks. Um, not that complicated, but super, super enjoyable. There's no <laughs> I judgment here about what the answer is going to be. <laughs> the answer, so thank you for that. Um, and then is there any like geology jokes that, you know, that are just like, and I'm totally putting you on the spot. And if, if you don't have one, that's totally fine. But I usually like to go, okay, is there something that's like super funny in the geology world that only geologists would really know about? Um, there's so many bad puns. Like, I don't even think that they're that funny, but like, I think they're kind of like a rite of passage that you go through like a, a bad pun, um, time. And so like the one is like nice, nice, um, nice rock. Cause nice is a type of rock or you could do like some with like bedding. There's a mineral called coming tonight. And so that also gets used all the time. <laughs> like that just becomes the, the kind of like throw away. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. There's like a couple Perfect. that are just like I mean, terrible, like- terrible puns. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're into it. Yeah. Yeah. So that like whoever named that mineral, I'm like, you just like every single 18 year old that first learned that they were like, this is my personality for the rest of the year. Like all <laughs> mineralogy. That's it. <laughs> you're my hero. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And then I guess, and very lastly, I always mm. like to ask people if they had any sage advice for people who are considering maybe in this case, getting into STEM or getting into the trades. Um, what would you say to somebody who was saying, Hey, I'm considering, you know, this kind of alternative path, if you want to call it that, um, what would you say to them? I'm going to try to channel my parents because my parents were the first generation themselves to go to university. We come from blue collar, um, background and blue collar roots. And for us, both trades and STEM were always given as the two same equal, um, opportunity and equal level of respect and the whole bit. I think that what they would say to us was really, it's going to, again, it's cheesy and it's cliche, but it was just like, it doesn't matter university versus trades versus art school, other than like, please don't drop out and leave in grade 11 when you're 17. But like, um, all options are equally as valid and equally as respected, but just choose the one that resonates with you the most. And then you're going to make it work as long as you love it everything will kind of fall into place. Like you'll be able to find a job. You'll be able to get well-paid. You'll be able to have mastery at your skill. Just like find something that you like to do. And I liked science and art. So that's my direction. Um, my sister, she loved, she didn't really know what trade she wanted to do, but she knew she wanted to be busy and use her hands. She ended up becoming a welder. She's now going to become a shipbuilder and a welding engineer. That's her path. She became obsessed with it. My other sister knew she wanted to help people. So she became a social worker. Like, I think we were at all just our advice, so the advice that my parents gave us. And I think that I followed is just follow what you like and what resonates with you and what aligns with you at that time. And then if it doesn't align with you, you can take a break or you can try something new or you'll figure it out along the way. It doesn't have to be this big, scary thing. Your journey is probably going to change, but to do the starting path of like trades, university, art school, they're all the same. Follow what feels good to you and sticks with you. Beautiful advice. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again for joining me on the show and, and for all the work that you're, you're doing with Peggy Workwear and the Smoko uh, podcast and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Me too. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It was such an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You bet. All right. And for those who are listening, keep it real. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. And be sure to check out all of our other episodes in this series, as well as all the other All Things Renovation series that we have going on. And until next time, keep being badass at whatever trade or work sector that you happen to be in. <laughs>